Welcome everyone to uh, the first OMR architecture meeting for uh, 2021. Um, today, uh, to kick off the year, um, I thought that what we could talk about is uh, a bit about what we've accomplished since the last time we did one of these uh, roadmaps in, uh, in early 2020, and to uh, look forward to what it is that uh, we hope to accomplish this year and uh, what some of the uh, items that we're looking at uh, a bit further out than that and where this project is uh, where this project is going. So to begin with, um, at the at the beginning of last year, and actually, I think it was very late in 2019, uh, we gave uh, a roadmap presentation for what we um, were thinking about accomplishing in 2020. And uh, what I've got here is I, I thought I'd go through those uh, slides that uh, I talked through last year and highlight what we've accomplished and uh, what new things we accomplished that we didn't think we were going to do last year. So uh, what you're seeing here is mostly the 2020 slides. Um, the resemblance in the top right there of the uh, 2020 uh, uh, star to a COVID uh, uh, virus is completely unintentional. Um, but uh, to begin with, uh, for the OMR project itself, uh, there were some some great uh, great accomplishments. So in total, we had uh, well over 700 pull requests merged. Um, the, the cool thing there is that we've had um, some new uh, co contributors to the project. Um, some brought in through working on beginner issues. So we've had nine of those completed last year. Um, and there was uh, a fair bit of work happening uh, throughout the various components of the project to uh, to reduce uh, technical debt, uh, refactor the code, uh, you know, provide better documentation and, and, and clear APIs, that sort of thing, um, either, either as part of uh, work that's specific to, to, to doing that or as part of other pull requests uh, uh, that, that, were, that were coming in. So completing that as part of uh, the daily work. Uh, we've had one new committer uh, join, join the ranks. So uh, Ben Thomas uh, became a committer for his, uh, for his great work on, in, the, in the project last year. Um, the other thing that we did at the project lay, uh, level last year was uh, to work on cleaning up uh, old issues and pull requests and uh, basically closing them off or having some kind of a resolution uh, for them. So uh, I, should, I should have mentioned actually that the color scheme that I'm using here um, is, uh, since these are the slides that I had used before, um, if we had completed something last year, I'll, I'll use green. If we have started work on something, and maybe not quite finished it. Uh, I'll use sort of an orangey color um, and new features that we didn't have on the on the plan, but uh, but we actually ended up doing. Um, I've got those in in blue, and then everything else that we didn't quite make any progress on um, is in black. Um, I'll also say that uh, when I'm speaking about a plan, I'm really just summarizing all the work that we know is happening on this project in the community. Um, this doesn't mean that this is the only thing that's going on with this project. Um, there certainly, um, you know, there, there certainly is um, other other uh, forks and things like that that are happening that um, that that may not be reflected here. Um, and it's certainly not the only thing that we uh, that we are like don't think of this as me telling you this is exactly what we have to do. This is just sort of a summary of, of, of all the things that we know that we're going to do and, uh, and where, where we're going to be taking some of these some of this project. Um, part of the uh, issue and, and pull request cleanup, I should say, um, was was helped by the fact that uh, by we added some automation for GitHub Actions, which uh, actually marked issues uh, and pull requests that are older than uh, a certain number of days. I think it was six months actually. And uh, if if there wasn't any response in those times, it would automatically get cleaned up. So um, we did close off some of those uh, some some 
older issues that way. But um, if you recall, if you've been participating with this group, uh, we did go through some of the very old issues and PRs to, to try to come up with some kind of a resolution for them. So the compiler component, um, we had a fair bit of, um, we were fairly uh, uh, ambitious with, with the work that we wanted to do last year. Um, because this deck, as I mentioned before, we, we talked about it in late 2019, um, we were still hoping to deliver uh, the RISC-V backend. And the RISC-V backend did actually land in December of uh, 2019. So um, that's really more of a 2019 statement than a, uh, than a 2020 statement. But, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we, we have a RISC-V backend and uh, we have seen some, uh, some incremental changes to that over the past uh, several months, which is, which is great to see. Uh, we did uh, also in 2019, we did some work on, on the options processing uh, framework. Um, and uh, we were hoping to land that as part of this project sometime uh, last year. And, and again, we've uh, we made some minimal progress on that. But uh, uh, I think that there's still some work that needs to get done on the infrastructure side in order for that to, to actually happen. Um, we also uh, made a bit of progress as well on the uh, on some conceptual integrity issues, and in particular on the resolved method side. Um, I know I have that one in particular on my on my list of things to do, and uh, I was able to make a bit of progress with that, um, but uh, but never quite got it uh, to the point where it's finished. And uh, and certainly this year is going to be one where um, I'm going to want to be pushing that forward for uh, for other reasons. Uh, but perhaps by far, a lot of the work that's happened on the compiler component, specifically last year, has been around the, the, the goal of the project to really converge the backend technologies and uh, encourage as much reuse as possible between them. Uh, this will, of course, lead to a, overall a, a simpler design and uh, a, a smaller code and more maintainable code because it is being shared between um, you know, the five backends that we have and plus risk five now will be, you know, a, a, a sixth back, a sixth back end. So um, there's a lot of uh, opportunities for, for sharing between them and a lot more opportunities for, for, for sharing. So we're just going to continue to exploit that. Um, and also hoisting uh, language specific features uh, out of OMR into the projects that uh, where they should probably more, uh, more likely belong. Uh, probably the the best example from those would be uh, would be uh, things that are specific to the to the OpenJ9 project uh, moved up into into OpenJ9 to um, simplify the code in OMR and can and and make it um, more language agnostic. Um, also, last year uh, there was a research project uh, from the University of Alberta that uh, that started uh, more than a year ago. Um, and the, the, the goal of that project was to study the, uh, the means that we're using to extend classes in the compiler and to determine whether or not that was actually the best approach to use or if there were alternatives that would, uh, that would uh, yield, um, that would be better. And um, as a result of that project, um, they studied a number of the requirements that this project has, um, the, the reasons that we had to design things certain way, uh, the, the, the constraints that this project has, like for example, the, the, the different platforms that it has to run on, the different compilers that, uh, that all need to be support, supported and the different language levels, things like that. And they took a lot of those into consideration to try to come up with um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the right answer for what it is that we should be doing. Um, in the end, unfortunately, um, even though the study ended last year, there wasn't any sort of firm conclusion as to, as to whether or not there was anything better or not. There, there were um, too many um, constraints and too many, uh, too many, um, um, you know, some of the challenges that we have that, it, that, that made that uh, difficult to, to recommend one approach over the other. Um, however, there, there, there probably are ways that we can continue to simplify the code 
um, and to try to eliminate some of the constraints and, and limitations that we have um, in order to make a better recommendation uh, in the future. So um, suffice it to say, um, at least in the short term, uh, going forward, uh, extensible classes are, are really going to be the means that we use to extend classes um, until we um, have a reason to, to, to change from that path. In the garbage collector component, um, so last January, um, Robert Young gave a an overview of the uh, of the garbage of the garbage collector and um, some of the cool ideas that uh, that were being explored with that. Um, some of those haven't made it onto this list just yet, but um, for for the for 2020, uh, the things that we did accomplish with uh, the, the the GC was uh, continued work on. Uh, producing a unified build for compressed and and, and native uh, pointers. Um, so this is really compressed pointers is really a representation of uh, an address in 32 bits uh, when, uh, when when that's possible. Um, at the moment, in order to support that, you actually have to build two different versions of the um, of the GC that you're using in order to make that happen. We want to unify that into just a single build, and uh, there's been some good progress made on that in the past in the past year. Um, some work for dynamic breadth for scan ordering was contributed as well. Um, I think that there's still some cleanup work that's that's happening there to to finish that off, but I think that a good bulk of that was uh, was contributed last year. In the port and thread library. Uh, there was uh, some work happening. There, there was some work contributed to to OMR as a result of the JIT server project in OpenJ9, and it was really to contribute uh, a network socket API uh, into OMR. Uh, it was a very you know, made in a very language agnostic way, so uh, there was a good fit for that. And there was also a, a potential uh, need for a socket API uh, in the port library. So. Um, a lot of good work went into that last year, and that was contributed um, in, in, in the summertime. Um, as well, we also uh, contributed some work for um, uh, processor detection features uh, from OpenJ9. So uh, the the means for determining what tar what the what kind of processor you're running on, and the features available on that processor, um, is a bit scattered throughout. OMR and it was a bit scattered throughout OpenJ9 as well. So there, there certainly was an attempt to, uh, to uh, centralize where that information um, could be determined. And uh, the port library is a very natural place for that. Um, but again, uh, we, we don't want to be duplicating code that already exists. And there was a good body of that code that was available in OpenJ9 uh, in their port library. So uh, with um, with some work, we were able to to lift a lot of that and uh, contribute it into the OMR port library. So um, that work um, uh, that work was completed. Um, on the JIT modeler side of things, um, there was uh, 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 some talk last year about uh, a uh, a JIT builder 2.0. Um, and some discussion around a, a newer representation, a new higher level IL representation. So um, Mark talked at the, uh, uh, at least a couple of the architecture meetings last year to describe his progress in evolving the, the JIT Builder IL. And um, that, um, you know, it's, it, we, we, we were able to make progress last year with that. Um, didn't quite get to a to a code contribution yet, but uh, I think that's going to be coming um, sometime this year. But uh, but nonetheless, the um, the IL has uh, has been evolving, or the the um, yeah the IL has been evolving. Uh, we also contributed a LLG uh, we, this project called LLJB, which was a uh, a project that was worked on uh, by a a student to provide support for uh, consuming LLVM uh, IR 
uh, via JIT Builder into uh, to convert that into uh, into Testarossa IL to be consumed by the compiler. So um, we really did that work as a means for um, con uh, uh, connecting uh, OMR technology with uh, with language front ends that are that are producing LLVM IR, um, so that we can do some experimentation with that and to possibly get some inroads uh, in those sorts of environments. So um, that project was. Uh, a pretty good success, and all that code was contributed to uh, uh, to uh, OMR last year. Um, the language, the the of all the other work, um, some work that we did last year was uh, around Java language bindings. Um, it was more of a sort of a, a lot of thought that went into that. Um, there was a research, there was a project that started uh, at a at uh, the U of A last year around Java language bindings. Um, it didn't quite get to the point where where it was finished and where code could be contributed, but uh, a fair bit of legwork and thinking went into that. So um, I imagine that that's uh, something that's going to carry on uh, into the into the future as we, as we were making some good progress there. Um, on the testing side, um, we unfortunately didn't get to many of the things that we wanted to get to. Um, after we gave this roadmap talk in um, for 2020, which again was in December of 2019, um, Shelley Lambert uh, uh, did talk at the architecture meeting about some of the ways that she thought um, that uh, that OMR testing could be evolved and some of the things that we'd like to do there. Um, unfortunately, this was a bit of a casualty of uh, of not having enough bodies to to help with some of this work. But uh, one thing that did come out last year that um, uh, that was actually not part of any of the plans was um, so a, a better means of testing the code that was being uh, generated by the by the power backend, and it's a, it's basically a means of of comparing the the, the encodings that the that the Testarossa compiler technology is using against another. Uh, source. So, for example, uh, uh, GCC, you can compare the outputs of those to see that they that there um, there's some consistency there. So, um, so that turned out to be a success on power, uh, and there certainly are is some opportunities for uh, replicating that kind of testing on the other backends that we uh, that we support in OMR. Um, on the infrastructure side, um, as I mentioned before, one of the main contributions was um, some work that Philip did to get GitHub Actions um, part of the uh, as in, enabled as part of the the, the development pipeline. So um, so that got on, and there's uh, you know a few things that uh, that were switched on as uh, as a result of that. Uh, I mentioned the stale issues, um, but we also have a job right now that runs that will. Um, um, Welcome a new contributor to the project, and give them a bit of information about uh, places to find information and 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 that sort of thing. So um, we can really now that we have that on and and, and working, it's really something that we can uh, consider using for uh, for for other reasons as well. Uh, the other thing that happened was uh, we deprecated the Travis CI. Um, uh, 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 testing that we were that we were doing in in favor of um, Azure uh, on the Microsoft Cloud, um, so uh, we're having some pretty good success with that, and it seems to be uh, more reliable and uh, a bit quicker than what we were getting with uh, with Travis CI. Um, we also had our thoughts on getting a RISC-V CI pipeline uh, enabled for. Uh, as a as a result of that, the, uh, as a result of the RISC-V backend getting contributed, we wanted to have a, a means of testing it. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't really any hardware available in the product in, in the in the project, but um, getting an emulated environment set up uh, was certainly a possibility. Um, unfortunately, we didn't really make a lot of progress on that until the last um, I would say you know six weeks to a, a couple of months uh, now uh, ago. And um, I think we're getting pretty close to being able to uh, enabling a RISC-V a CI pipeline using an emulated environment. So um, things are looking uh, good there. So I'm hoping that one's going to get resolved pretty soon. 
Uh, not much really happened on the website and documentation. Um, some offline progress was made on the Wikipedia entry um, just to make sure that we get the right text and the right citations and things like that so it doesn't get rejected. Um, somebody did go and did actually go and created an OMR um, Wikipedia entry last year, but it was um, um, shunned by the community, um, unfortunately, and so it was shut down. Um, so um, the one that uh, that I've kind of been working on in the background um, does uh, satisfy and uh, it should satisfy uh, enough of the requirements that uh, that it won't get uh, immediately rejected. Um, so hopefully we can get that uh, contributed soon. Okay, so that was 2020 um, we did. So looking forward to this year, um, uh, just reflecting a bit on the on, on the reality of the of, of what we know to be of what we know um, on on the resources that we have that are working on OMR specifically. Um, I think what you'll find here is that uh, that what, what I have is uh, a little bit less aggressive than what we had uh, uh, hoped for last year. Um, it's a little bit more on the realistic side. And uh, and I think that a lot of these ones are going to immediately benefit some of the work that's already happening in the, in, in the project. So uh, from the compiler point of view, um, one of the things that has come up uh, of late for other projects, but it's really sort of owned by OMR or around the vector IL opcodes. And uh, we had a discussion on this as part of the OMR architecture meeting almost two years ago now on ways that we can adapt and simplify and make uh, um, and just make a little bit more understandable understandable the, the the way that we're representing vector operations in our uh, high level IL. So uh, really, the issue here is to um, is to perhaps dust some of that off and uh, and and make it a reality. And uh, the fact that there's another project, uh, an upstream project, sorry, a downstream project. Um, wanting and needing to do this uh, may give this some additional uh, focus for sure this year. Um, the other tasks that we have around for, for the compiler specifically um, are really around just the technical debt reduction. So things like continuing the code generator convergence. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening there um, as part of other PRs, not necessarily specific to just converging the code generators, but as more work is happening, um, where the the community is looking a lot more these days for for opportunities where work can be shared across the different backends, uh, which is great and something that we should definitely continue. So um, that's going to keep happening. Um, and again, uh, also just uh, re refactoring more things from OMR and working on refining um, the IL opcode semantics. Um, for JIT Builder, uh, we're hoping to get an initial contribution of some of the things that, uh, that Mark had talked about for JIT Builder 2.0 uh, contributed into the code base um, sometime this year. So, uh, and by sometime, I mean probably the first half at some point. So that'll be a good, um, sort of stake in the ground for for JIT Builder 2.0 for others to to see what to have something concrete in front of them and for us to continue to build on. Um, once that is there, uh, I do expect that there will be some incremental progress uh, being made on top of that uh, to implement. Uh, well, in, in the event that there are projects that are consuming uh, JIT Builder and uh, want to build upon the API that's that's there, uh, plus some of the other ideas that, uh, that Mark has there. Um, and then there's going to be some work to improve the integration of JIT Builder into other language environments. Um, we've taken uh, a couple of runs at this in the past, and there are some known limitations um, that there are, there are. There are some limitations with um, with uh, JIT Builder and the OMR compiler technology that prevent it from um, integrating nicely into some language environments. We tried to solve some of those last year. Actually, we talked about um, uh, you know the, the the memory allocation story. 
Um, you know, the, the resolved method stuff is, 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 is related to this as well. There are other problems as well, um, but uh, it's important to, to solve these sorts of things so that uh, JIT Builder can be used um, in, in, in other uh, environments, such as, uh, such as OpenJ9, for example. So um, uh, we hope to uh, uh, you know, identify and solve as many of those problems as we can uh, this year to make, um, to make this technology as portable as possible. On the port and garbage collector side, um, I think the main two contributions that we'd like to see this year is, and we talked about this at the architecture meeting uh, a few months back, um, is, to is to have some sort of initialization story for the port library so that it can be consumed in the compiler and JIT builder. Um, there are, um, the, the result of the last discussion that we had had was around um, basically having a simplified, it doesn't solve every single problem that, 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 that has come up, but uh, we can have a simplified way of, of initializing the port library just so that it can be used within the compiler and JIT builder. Um, just having the port library there will, um, will simplify some things and eliminate some of the duplicate code that we have in the compiler um, that's already implemented in the port library. So that's the kind of thing that uh, that we like to see um, happen. Uh, and then the other thing that I'm expecting to um, make a fair bit of progress, if not complete this year, on the GC side is is the um, compressed and native uh, native reference build work. Um, on the infrastructure side, um, this looks a lot like what we had hoped for for for, for 2020. Um, uh, we're still fairly deficient on ART64 hardware and I guess RISC-V hardware for that matter, uh, the newer platforms. Um, we are still on the lookout for finding new ART64 hardware to contribute to the project so that we can do testing on it. Uh, right now we're only doing uh, builds only. We don't actually execute any of the tests on it. Um, and this is, uh, this is certainly problematic. Um, same thing for Risk Five. Uh, actually, for Risk Five, we don't even have a build yet, um, but that uh, we're getting very close to uh, um, to enabling something like that. Um, if we can't actually get ART64 hardware, we could potentially build on the work that's happened for Risk Five um, to build and emulate and and build and emulate on on ART64 as well. So that's um, that's a positive step forward. But uh, having real access to real devices um, would be ideal. And we're still on the lookout for Air 64, as I said, and possibly getting some contributions from the RISC-V community uh, for hardware there. Uh, there are still a couple of builds that are not um, uh, CMake, uh, that, 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 aren't, that haven't been ported to CMake. Um, so we need to, um, complete those, and then we can finally deprecate our auto tools dependence. Uh, um, and then one thing that, um, I mean, especially this time of year where it's um, particularly um, comes up a lot uh, is on the copyright verification. So we don't actually have a story there. Um, I've got a couple of thoughts that I'm gonna drop in the issue at some point in the next day or so, just so that we can possibly move this forward. And, uh, and have some means of checking the copyright dates and all the commits so that, um, so that people don't miss those. Um, so not a, um, um, an exhaustive list for 2021, but um, there's certainly possible that looking a little bit further out, um, some of these items could get done uh, sooner as well. So um, duplicated uh, a lot of the, uh, our, our project goals from, from 2020 here, because um, as there are other projects that are potentially consuming OMR, um, there may be a greater need for, uh, for increasing, for doing releases and uh, increasing the cadence of the releases that we, that we have um, and the stability of those of those releases. So um, I don't, I'm not sure if 2021 is the year for that, but but coming soon we may 
need to start to put into place a, a more rigorous uh, release process for this project. And as part of that is the, uh, the plan for the API stability on the components that don't have a stable API. So um, of course I'm, my finger is pointing at the compiler and, uh, and, and, and JIT builder um, as, as the main ones that need to uh, choose and stabilize on a particular API. The other thing that, uh, that we can do as part of the project is we have a lot of uh, really good ideas and directions that we want the project to go. Um, there's also a lot of people that have come to the project wanting to help in some way, shape or form, but it's been difficult for them to get a toehold in the project because uh, some of the tasks that we want them to do or that, 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 that we want the project to do are far too large or they're far too nebulous and they need to be broken down into much smaller pieces in order for someone to consume and uh, and take it on because uh, you know people are coming to the project they're not coming you know necessarily with uh, the ability to, to to devote all their time to it they're coming in really more of a part-time context um, so uh, if we can take some of the bigger ideas that we have and break them into smaller ideas so that it would encourage others to, uh, to participate, um, that should be one of the goals that we, that we strive for. Um, I have this after 2021, but certainly this is the kind of thing that we can start um, sooner rather than, than later. Um, we also have a very large, um, I mean, I, I call it a large issue backlog and a, and a pull request backlog. Um, we can issue and like we have you know in, in the hundreds it's not like it's a, an overwhelmingly large um, issue backlog but nonetheless um, I think that uh, um, there is work that we can do to continue to um, um, re to, to ensure that some attention is paid to, to the older uh, issues or PRs that were that were opened and that uh, and that we continue to move things on and and the other thing is to make sure that, if somebody does open an issue that we don't um, forget about them, um, you know, people are opening in a, in a handful of cases there, you know, people may be opening problems that don't get immediate attention. And um, as a, as a community, um, we should be working to, uh, to address those problems and at least give them some um, attention as, as soon as you possibly can. Um, from the compiler point of view, um, looking forward, there's a fair bit of things that, um, that we want to do in the, uh, that we know that we can do. Um, looking at our new backends, um, AR64 and RISC-V, there are a few opcodes still that, that haven't been implemented yet. Um, some of those may come as part of work to uh, consume, consume these backends in the OpenJ9 project. But uh, they certainly don't have to be done as part of that. Um, so uh, more IL opcodes need to be uh, completed to bring them to parity with the other um, the other architectures. Um, there has been some as part of the work to uh, common data structures um, between the different backends. Um, I don't mean common. I mean just use a use the same kind of representation of the different data structures between the backends. Um, we can certainly look at more than just things like the instruction opcodes or the instructions, um, and uh, think about other uh, table data structures within the compiler that could possibly benefit from uh, a more um, automatic generation and. And, and to improve maintenance of this. So we, we've talked about this in the past at, uh, at other architecture meetings, but um, haven't really made a lot of progress um, on this. Um, this is really more just a simplification item to make things easier to generate um, and to make things easier to share across different projects. Uh, like the, the options one, for example, is a, is a good one in that it is able to produce a single table that, is, that, is, that takes requirements from OMR and it will take a requirement from a downstream project like OpenJ9 and synthesize everything together automatically into like a single into a single table, as opposed to sort of a confusing way of saying a little bit comes from here and then I got to go over there and grab a little bit from from OpenJ9 
it just pulls everything together into a nice uh, representation. So there are other um, table structures um, in the compiler that could potentially benefit from this kind of unification. Um, things like in the like value pro uh, um, uh, value propagation tables or simplifier tables, op other opcodes tables, things like that. Um, some work needs to happen on providing metadata for uh, the, the artifacts that are compiled by the compiler. Um, having metadata associated alongside uh, a method allows, you know, additional information to be to be stored there that could be used by by certain language runtimes. Um, one example of this is going to be uh, garbage collector map uh, information. Um, there is uh, a growing interest in leveraging OMR in environments that have got garbage collectors and and JITs. And one of the things that would be required for that in order for us to use the OMR garbage collector technology is to have a representation of um, of the um, of, of what's live at certain points in a in a method as it's being compiled. And so we use a GC map for that. And that's typically stored in something we call method metadata, but it doesn't really exist in any real form in OMR just yet. So we'd like to, to generalize and surface some of that. Um, metadata is also useful for, um, if you're doing more inlining, it's useful for encapturing information about exception ranges, um, plus other things for other languages that, uh, language front ends that we haven't really um, uh, considered just yet. So we need to provide a more generic uh, framework for that. Um, the memory allocation story, um, like I said, we talked about that at least a couple of times last year, and uh, and uh, a few of us did make a bit of progress on 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 trying to come up with a simplified design for that. Um, but there are a number of there's certainly a lot of complexities that we have to uh, to work through there. Um, the unfortunate thing about the memory allocation story in in the compiler right now is that it is. Um, it isn't very consistent. It's very difficult to, for anybody to understand if you're not already deeply involved with, with it. Um, and uh, there are at least uh, 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 there are at least a couple of different implementations of of of, of parts of it that need to be um, unified. I would say. So um, I know it's a t it's a very difficult problem to uh, to to work on. Um, and it's also one that is so difficult that it often gets pushed aside uh, because of the effort that will require in order for us to do something there. But I do think that um, in order to meet some of our goals of, for example, porting JIT Builder into other environments, these are the kinds of things that we're going to have to uh, to make some progress on and solve in order to make that a reality. Um, floating point. Uh, uh, in OMR is uh, is another area that uh, that needs some some definition. I would say uh, I think just uh, coming up with uh, the 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 right strategy for OMR to handle floating point, the way that things are represented, what things mean. I think that's important to do. Um, it's um, we've had this on the list for a little while now, um, but uh, it just hasn't bubbled high enough on the priority list uh, to really make any progress on it. Um, there is going to be some work very likely happening in OMR this year around vector and uh, and SIMD support and various uh, and various architectures. Um, some of this is being driven by OpenJ9 and their vector API that's coming up. But uh, but ART64, for example, doesn't have uh, any vector support implemented. But um, I know that there are those that are working on. Uh, an implementation for vector for ART64 that will hopefully land sometime this year. Um, and part of this will be tied in with um, an overall floating point strategy. So um, footprint in the compiler. Um, so this is, um, uh, we, I mean, we have received feedback in the past from, um, from people in the community um, and from downstream projects uh, about the size of the compiler footprint. Um, this isn't necessarily just the amount of memory that it consumes, but the actual on-disk footprint of the 
of the uh, of the um, of the shared object that gets produced when you when you build the compiler, and um, there has been some preferences on um, uh, mentioned about you know the the compiler needs to fit under a certain in, in a certain window for it to be useful in a certain environment. Um, so uh, we have started doing some investigation on reducing the overall compiler footprint, but um, and we're still working on on landing some of that. Actually, I should have had this kind of a um, a bullet point on the 2020 accomplishments because we did we did make some progress there in 2020. Um, but uh, there's still more study that needs to happen on what parts of the JIT are consuming uh, a lot of space, and are there areas that we or are there things that we can do to um, to eliminate or or you know, make some of those parts of the compiler optional if somebody doesn't want um, doesn't want to to use them. Just to give you an example: if you're running in an environment and you don't care anything about um, you know the vector instructions, for example, the SIMD instructions, then perhaps you could build them out entirely so that the compiler does not support generating them at all or any of the uh, evaluators for them, and uh, you could potentially save uh, some footprint that way. So we need to continue to study that going forward. Um, and then I'll, I mean, seem to be on a theme of vector here. Um, we don't actually have support for Intel AVX 512 uh, support just yet. Um, there is some rework that has to happen in the x86 backend in order to make this a reality. So it isn't just a matter of going through the uh, the Intel docs and, and, and implementing it. Uh, some rework does need to happen. That's, uh, that's not trivial to do. So um, hopefully we can make some progress or start making some progress on that um, in the in the near future in the compiler. Uh, for JIT Builder, um, uh, you know, this is really building more on, uh, you know, moving out from, from JIT Builder 2.0. Um, one of the things, one of the topics that has come up um, in, in several conversations about JIT Builder has been its, uh, its integration with with the GC and the kinds of things that the JIT builder needs to be able to provide in order to um, to work with the garbage collector. So, for example, the ability to produce maps and uh, you know means of producing or allocating objects. If there's any sort of barriers, memory access barriers that are needed for a particular memory model, that sort of thing. So um, that's one of the things that um, we think JIT builder needs to uh, be to integrate better with going forward. Um, also making sure that JIT Builder runs on as many platforms as possible. Um, in 2019, we did um, a fair bit of work to get JIT Builder running in, in Z on the ZOS platform. Um, I do know that, that there is some interest in, in, in continuing to work with JIT Builder uh, on, on ZOS. So there can, you know, there's, there, there's something to build on there, but making sure that it runs in all environments that are um, that are of interest is is important and uh, making changes as necessary to the way that the project is structured or the code is structured uh, or built for the tool chain that kind of thing in order to make that happen is uh, is important um, also working on uh, continuing to build on JIT Builder 2.0 um, and also working on taking that and building it into existing language front ends to demonstrate that it that it can be done and uh, um, and uh, you know providing a concrete example for for those to study and uh, um, to move forward with uh, Java language bindings. Uh, that's that's another thing. So the ability to invoke JIT Builder from within uh, a Java uh, method um, uh, to basically provide uh, customized control over snippets of code that you like to like to see built. Uh, that is a feature that uh, we think has got some promise in some contexts that uh, we'd like to continue working on. Um, like I said before, it was started as a research project last year, but uh, um, uh, more work needs to happen there to, to finish it up. Uh, and then just ongoing refactoring and documentation improvements to make it easier to understand and to get others to, uh, to help work on it. Uh, on the GC side, um, one of the things that has come up um, of late is uh, how to take the, the GC code that we have, which has been written in C++, 
and integrate it better with uh, C-based language environment. Um, so this is really about trying to understand, doing the things that we need to do in order to, to, to build the GC, um, to integrate it better with um, environments that are, that are based in C. Um, so part of this work is to figure out what that is and then, and then really just make it happen. Um, there was a flurry of activity around metronome, um, you know, more than a year ago. Um, and I guess we need to decide whether or not that's something that we want to continue to contribute into, um, into OMR um, and, uh, and where it's going to go. Um, metronome, for those that don't know, is, uh, is a, is a real-time garbage collector, which makes uh, guarantees over the, uh, the pause times as it's, uh, as it's collecting. So um, there, there certainly is um, you know, some cool technology there um, that's coming from OpenJ9, but I think just finding a place for it in OMR and figuring out how we can you know, integrate and test it is, um, is one of the things that uh, we need to figure out still. Um, on the testing side, uh, still lots of things that, uh, that need to happen here. Um, you know, uh, the, we talked about this uh, at the end of 2019 with Shelley, and some of these certainly came from, came from her list. Um, but uh, um, looking at what it is that we're, what we're currently testing and how we're testing it, is um, is certainly important, like doing that kind of a review, restructuring the the, the test directory that we have. Um, one of the big things that Shelley talked about was uh, facilitating downstream project testing in OMR to make problems um, to, to make diagnosing problems um, earlier. So um, I guess it would be nice to to dust off some of those ideas and to uh, to start making them a reality. Um, Taking the work that happened last year on power and expanding uh, to, for testing binary encoding and power and making it work across other architectures, uh, that's certainly something that we'd like to to, to roll out as well. Um, it seems to be uh, the potential of catching some problems uh, much sooner than um, and, and in a much more deterministic way than than encountering it out in the field. Um, and then trill uh, the the means of injecting um, IL directly into the compiler. We're doing very targeted testing. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the work that's happened on Trill has has stalled of late. But um, looking forward, you know, there certainly is a long list of things that we want to do, and uh, continuing to evolve the, the 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 compiler testing story. Because as um, as OMR as the OMR compiler is starting to be used in more and more environments. Um, it's going to become harder and harder to test in some cases some of these different environments. But having the ability to inject trees into into the common backend and into the common uh, compiler might make things um, simplify some of the testing process. Um, there is a roadmap that we had come up with um, maybe a, a couple of years back, and it's really just uh, finding the time to continue on that path and uh, and making some of those things a reality. Uh, on the infrastructure side, um, one of the things that's still open, um, it's uh, at the beginning of last year, we had a, at the end of 2019, beginning of last year, there was um, some activity around a consistent source code format, formatting uh, effort in, in the, uh, throughout the OMR code base, uh, just to give it a consistent look and feel. Um, there was um, a fair bit of discussion and opinions around that, and in the end, it um, um, it didn't end up uh, happening. Um, but I think that there uh, th there is something to potentially salvage from the discussions that that that, that did happen. That um, I think that there is uh, an opportunity for uh, trying something again, perhaps in a different form, that might be more amenable. To uh, to the problems that were raised in the uh, in the previous discussion. So um, uh, at some point in the future, um, we may see something coming again uh, around that. Because um, if you look outside just the, um, the sort of the regular users of, of of OMR and OMR consumed in OpenJ9, um, there is interest in 
providing a, a consistent uh, uh, source code formatting. So uh, from from those that don't normally participate in this, so uh, we'll, it's not forgotten, but uh, we have to make sure that we solve as many of the problems that were raised uh, before as we can. And finally, um, website and documentation. So always something that's good to do, but unfortunately something we just don't normally have a lot of time uh, to do. Uh, just continuing to improve the, um, uh, the, the, the documentation that's available with uh, OMR. Um, this is really more about, well, I guess what's sort of presented on the, on the, on the slide here is really more about things that you'd find on the website. Uh, as opposed to documentation that you'd find in the docs directory of the repo. Um, we've actually been pretty good of late of creating new documentation in the repo itself. Um, you know, often fairly small bits of documentation, but but useful nonetheless, um, as opposed to writing a blog or some deeper technical article on something. So um, it's it's important to do the blogging and 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 things like that in order to um, increase the visibility of the project and to um, you know, have it appear to be um, you know fairly um, you know you know eminent and uh, and so that others can can see that there's a lot some of the cool things that are happening on on the project itself. And I think that's my last slide here. So um, I'm going to stop there and uh, open this up for any discussion that uh, anybody wants to have on any of these uh, any of these points um, in particular you know if there's anything that if there's any area that uh, you think that uh, we should be focusing on that uh, that isn't getting enough attention here um, if there's some idea here that's uh, really wild and crazy that uh, you think has no hope of uh, of ever seeing the light of day um, I can hear that too. So, any thoughts on that? I just wanted to jump in and uh, iterate the comment that I made in the chat. I do have to drop <laughs> for another call, but I just wanted to thank you very much for putting together this presentation and the summary and delivering to the community. And look forward to uh, um, all the conversations that will happen next on on where we're where we're taking things. So, okay. thanks, Mark. Thanks again, and uh, see you soon, everyone. <laughs>